Hi, it's Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of Sustainable Cannabis TV. Today, I'm here with Christy Pennington, uh, Canabama Christy. How are you? Hey, you're doing well. Good morning, Ben. I, I like the I like the name Canabama. So, uh, tell the viewers and listeners about that, and then give some history. You know where you're from. You know where you are now, and really what got you into the industry and what you're up to now. Absolutely, Ben. So, Canabama Christy. My name is Christy. I'm from Alabama, and I consider myself a cannabis lifer. So, what I mean by that is. Back in Alabama, I had a cheerleading accident and ended up choosing cannabis for chronic pain by the time I was in college at the University of Alabama, Roll Tide, mm -hmm. and uh, ended up getting myself into the cannabis industry to, to be able to make an impact and bring cannabis back to places like Alabama. So the um, so you, you chose cannabis over you know, medications or, or really what, what was that decision or journey uh, around that time? Well, being from Alabama, I injured myself at 15 and cannabis is not something that was available to me as an option. So first I was introduced to Percocets and other opioids that were given to me for pain and also went through a journey, journey, of course, tried physical therapy, had a small surgery and uh, ended up finding out at 15 that I was going to have chronic back pain for the rest of my life. Mm. Mm. Got it. Yeah, that's a, it's a challenge. Well, we'll get into that in a, a bit later, but that's an interesting story. And I know that, that uh, you know, we've had a couple conversations the past couple of days on this show about that, you know, really opioids versus cannabis. So uh, interested to hear your story. But so I know that you you fight for safe access for all. Can you tell me about that? Really, you know, what you're passionate about in in helping with access. And, you you know, I'm sure that that does uh, go into kind of where you are in the country and the laws and stuff like that. So tell the viewers and listeners really your, your story around that. I started off in the cannabis industry, been at Cresco Labs in Chicago, Illinois. So I'd been looking at ways to get out of my current industry, thought about moving out to Colorado or California. And then I just happened to look on Indeed and did a little research and uh, got a job at Cresco Labs with patient outreach um, within about a week, which was pretty crazy. I went from not being in the industry to telling my mom and everyone, hey, I'm about to come out and let the world know that I've been using cannabis for chronic pain and had been free of opioids for, at that time, it was around four years when I got into the industry. The, and, uh, what, was that, what was that like telling your, your, your mom? <laughs> well, luckily she has, she says she's never used cannabis herself. Uh, she's currently consuming CBD and uh, also doing some side sales for CBD. But back in, I mean, now it's been, well, 2018 since I got into the business. And at that time, like I said, around going on four years since I've been without opioids, she's seen the transition and she's seen, you know, how I went from being more zombie-like, more not myself to to seeing what a, a difference she saw in me personally from being free of opioids and only on cannabis and just consuming cannabis and you know smoking. I had to explain to her the different forms and how they all came from smoking because someone that's looked into CBD and the oil, she really saw cannabis, the plant, and it's like smoking a joint as, as still doing drugs. So <laughs> I had mm -hmm. to, you know, educate her a little on that. And, and now she speaks up at different town halls and things in Tennessee, where she's currently located in support. Wow. So it's been from, from nothing to being very supportive, which has been incredible to watch. So how do you see the, the laws changing so that, that the country will have safe access? Like, is it slow? Is, it, is the South going to be, you know, hard to come by? A lot of education. You have a lot of people, you know, like your mom before. Um, you know, really, what, what's that like, that transition? 
I think now the fact that I believe here in the U.S. we have 35 states plus uh, Washington, D.C. with medical access. So just the fact that, you know, well, obviously COVID and, and the epidemic that we've gone through and the fact that cannabis in most states, Illinois and Michigan, where I'm located, were essential, you know. So when everything else was closed down, dispensaries were allowed to be open. We were all still going to work all hours of the day when everyone else was on lockdown. Mm -hmm. I think if you had no idea that we should all have the same access and that cannabis was actually something people were consuming and was helping for medicine, then this past year has shown you that just mm -hmm. by what was allowed to be open and what's not. Well, what about people who are completely you know, opposed to it? Do you think that COVID has changed their mind at all? I, I think it has to. If, if mm -hmm. not, then those people, I feel like, Maybe they're not living in the same world I'm living or are just not open-minded, you know? Yeah. Last year I went down to, to Birmingham. I had a customer down there, Gold Leaf, and I spent a couple of days. And it's amazing just the difference from walking around the streets here, you know, in Denver, where there are dispensaries everywhere to walking around, you know, in Birmingham, just to see the difference and feel the difference in the culture. And I spent time in, in Louisiana, you know, it's, it's, a, it's hugely different. And I think it will take time, but it will slowly change. 100%. Yeah. I think more people, I mean, your show, this, the fact that you're on LinkedIn Live <laughs> talking about cannabis every day, people from all states and, you know, from all countries are, are allowed to be on the same network. And I think mm -hmm. the more that we all work together and share our stories and do small things like this, the more people that if they haven't been touched by someone else's story or they haven't read, seen, or, or had a personal experience, then you know, something's going to end up reaching out to those people. And this is a good start. You know, that's a good point. That, and, and I want to say LinkedIn, the reason why I started doing LinkedIn, you know, these kind of interviews is because it's not regulated. You know, it's not like Facebook or some of the other ones where, or, you know, Instagram, where you can just have an account taken down, you know, just, just taken down, you know, you work years to build it. But this, this platform StreamYard, as well as LinkedIn, they're, they're cannabis friendly, or at least they're, they're no one telling us that we can't say <laughs> weed or swear or smoke on here or anything like that. So I, th I think your point is well taken that it's a, it's a B2B platform and it's not just, you know, and I'm, I'm air quoting here, you know, stoners sitting on sofas. Right. Um, uh, it's really, there, there's so many pieces and, in, in, uh, you know, facets to this industry and it is, a, it is B2B and it is medicine and there are a lot of healing properties. And when people understand that more so, they'll open their eyes and not just say, oh, it's a drug and it's illegal. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. So I'm well, here today. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. The, um, you know, let's talk about eliminating the stigma. So you touched on it a bit there and we kind of talked about, you know, the different parts of the country. But how do you see that changing and, you know, the stigma that's around what is it really about it that people are saying it's bad other than that, other than kind of old uneducated prejudices? Maybe that's it. But what are you seeing and how do you go about eliminating the stigma? I feel exactly what you what you say, you know, old. I mean, the, the fact that it's cannabis is federally illegal and that it's a schedule one drug with no medical benefits. You see me here right now, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> I know, you know, as, as long as people believe in the government and believe, you know, what we're told, I feel like it's going to take a little bit longer, you know, for those things to start, start to change. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, we declassify cannabis as a schedule four, like United Nations just did, or, you know, just look at it differently, that alone will help to eliminate and normalize cannabis. I mean, you know, if we're looked at it as well, it's got no medical benefit, it's the same as heroin, <laughs> you know, it's a, a little harder to, to normalize and, and make cannabis something that people see as an option for medicine before years of opioids or before other things that have not worked and that's been their last resort when sometimes maybe if it was a first resort, other things wouldn't happen like suicide and opioid dependency and things like that. You know, the crazy thing about it is, you know, we consume, you know, way more 
alcohol and opioids in this country, you know, and there are mm -hmm. so many deaths and, you know, just complications and, you know, so many, so many challenges from domestic wow. abuse to incarceration, all these things. And it's like, you know, when you, when you have that conversation with someone about the differences between cannabis, legal cannabis and alcohol, they're kind of like, well, it, it, you know, you barely can talk to people about it in a rational way because then you just see the blinders go up in terms of cannabis is bad, but alcohol is okay. You know, mm -hmm. so it seems like the more education is out there around the, the healing benefits of it, you know, the more the people are going to start to open their eyes and it will take time, but it is happening, I think, faster. I mean, I know it's slow, but it's faster than a lot of people in the industry thought, you know, mm -hmm. let's say 10 years ago, it's happened relatively quickly and it's accelerating and compounding through, as we were talking about the kind of you know, legitimate, uh, legitimate conversations around medicine and healing and B2B and ancillary and economy, you know, all these things that make it more of a legitimized business, not just a business that's in the shadows anymore, right. uh, just, you know, by people doing illegal things, you know, it's and legal. Just, it's legal. Speaking of the shadows, you know, that's another reason why I think it, it, it matters to, you know, people of all different races and all different backgrounds to speak up at their cannabis consumption and what they're doing and, you know, different reasons and, and ways that they've been negative, negatively impacted because I think, you know, just recently coming up in U.S. House, I believe it was a few Democratic sen senators kind of brought up the fact that there's a lot of disproportionately people impacted by what's been going on. So, you know, more than just the medicinal side of things, which obviously has been around for ages, but the the stuff that we've done here at, as a country to to put certain people in positions where they shouldn't be when, you know, I, I'm out selling weed every day and people in other states are going to jail for the same thing. Yeah, I think they're, you know, we're, we're starting to see some, you know, major overhaul, which needs to happen in terms of the criminal justice system around cannabis right. incarceration. And it's, yeah, I mean, we just need to open our eyes more and, and really dig into that. And I know there are a lot of people who are working on it, you know, really, really diligently to to make some major inroads in there, so. Yeah, it's exciting yeah. to see. It's been a year full of many changes and uh, progression for sure, as well as steps back, so. Yeah, you know, the, this year has been difficult in many ways, you know, the past 12 months, but it has sparked some some massive, massive needed change in this mm -hmm. country. So, you know, wherever you have that con uh, contraction, you always have expansion uh, exploding out of that, either an in innovation or opening eyes, or just, you know, just because of the way that the, the economy works, culture works, things right. just happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise without this. So Agreed. have to see the, see the positives in, in the past year, I guess. Yes, sir. <laughs> The um, well, let's talk about. I'd, I'd like to get back to you know your your you know you're no stranger to chronic pain, and I would like to dig into that some because uh, you know that journey is important to to talk about you know in terms of how you coped and you know cannabis use and the opioids, and I'd like to dig into that some more. Absolutely. So, like I said, I I injured myself in in high school. So at the age of fifteen, I had a cheerleading accident. And basically find, found out then that like, hey, here's some Percocets, here's physical therapy, here's surgery we can look at, but you're going to be dealing with this for the rest of your life. Really? And wow. um, so just understanding that I was smart individual, I ended up only having access to, to opioids, you know, through the rest of my high school. I had my first surgery right before I turned 16 hmm. <laughs> on my back. Yeah. And wow. um, of course, after that, immediate was here's some pain pills. And I was smart enough to understand. I, I ended up graduating high school valedictorian, still hadn't smoked weed yet. <laughs> and, um, you know, I understood that this was something that I was going to be dealing with my whole life. You know, it wasn't going to go away. You know, I'd seen what was happening. I'm from a small town. I, I know that pills and things are way more accessible and, and affordable than medical cannabis in, in states where that's allowed. So I, you know, I understood that. And um, I basically said like, that's, that's not going to be me. <laughs> and so I, I found a way to, to really 
make sure I wasn't being dependent on opioids, but at the same time, get to college, you know, things just progressively keep adding on and injury just keeps compounding. It's like chronic pain, you know, repetitive injury to the same location. Mm. <laughs> you know, I get, get those kind of diagnoses. And um, ended up being, uh, I got to college and I uh, went to University of Alabama and I'm a big football fan and I hung out with a lot of football players. And of course, they weren't allowed to, to smoke weed for pain, but a lot of them did. Mm. And um, so I, I was introduced to cannabis, you know, from people of color in an area where it was illegal, but also all for medicinal purposes, you know, we, and, and I immediately understood, hey, this, this is going to work for me. And that was mm -hmm. around 22. And I lived in Alabama. So was it a, did you, was it cold turkey then? Did you say, I'm not going to do any of the pain meds or, or was it gradual and over time? Gradual and over time. I think a uh, situation and where I live, which is why I say safe access for everyone is important to me because um, I, I ended up moving to Chicago in 2012. I'd been living in, in Texas. I was taking Oxycontin every day, anti-inflammatory, you know, anti anti-inflammatory, muscle relaxers, antidepressants, everything. Mm -hmm. And I ended up moving to Chicago to get into an area where I could get around more. I could have independence back to maybe get rid of some of those other side effects and issues that you deal with having chronic pain and, you know, being stuck at home and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I uh, ended up moving to Chicago and found out, you know, the medical program started, I believe, 2015 ended up getting my medical card 2016. But when I first moved to Chicago, I, I came, you know, own a lot of medications already, controlled substances that you can't transfer across state line. Hmm. And I, I really got to experience the opioid epidemic in Chicago when I get to my first doctor's appointment where I'm supposed to be getting a refill on what I, I came from Texas, Oxycontin, which obviously I, I didn't want to be consuming or taking at the time, but my body was pretty used to it. And that's what had been given to me in Texas. And mm. the doctor there literally sent me home, Ben, with five Lortab fives, which if you're familiar with any of the dosing or, or the difference in, in opioids and different pain pills, it, it wasn't even one of my doses that I should have had for that day. So mm. here I am, I'm in a new place new people i think that i'm going to be taken care of by the medical system and immediately you know i was you you get you get the stigma both from the opioid side and the cannabis hmm. and um so i got sent home with that in chicago and ended up being someone that had to go out and you know get medication from the streets if you will so and you know i was i was put into that situation not anything that I should have been <laughs> clearly had a history of chronic pain, you know, I mm -hmm. shouldn't have been put in that situation. And it made me understand more the fact that people who even are gradually changing and, you know, using cannabis and, and, and consuming pills, you know, less, it, it still is a process. And a, and a lot of times it, and it took me understanding more forms of consumption so in, in Alabama, I only smoked. And um, once Illinois got the medical program and I ended up getting my card, then I had access to RSO oil, to topicals, to you know dabs, to edibles, to more forms of consumption that could last longer. Mm. So, you know, being able to help educate on, on you know, it's not just one form, it's, it takes different kinds. And coming off the opioids, I feel like, that's given me a, a sense of just, uh, you know, real life experience that, that most people don't get, which makes me very passionate about all of this. So when you, when you said that, that there's stigma around both opioids and cannabis, so in your experience, what I'm hearing is that um, because you had to take a lot of medication, uh, either one for your pain, people looked at you like you were an abuser, not just a patient. Correct. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, I, I mean, you know, that just goes in to say that no matter where you, who you are, where you're from, what your situation is, you know, the, the system is still kind of against us in a way, mm-hmm. both um, on the criminal justice side and the health care. So I feel like we have a lot of improvement that needs to be made on both of those avenues. Yeah. Well, um, question of, uh, back about the pain earlier. You'd said that your, your mom had said that you had cleared up, you know, that you were less hazy or fuzzy or something like that. So can you tell me about that, like how you felt and how you viewed the world of on opioids versus on cannabis? I feel like, it's funny you ask that, whenever you're actually on opioids, you, you don't really, you don't know how you're treating people. You don't really understand how you're coming across until you've had someone that knows how to communicate that to you and helps you understand like, hey, you're, you know, I knew you before, I know you now, and this is not you. Hmm. And so it it, it kind of takes like having people in your life that support you in that way, which not everyone has. I, I did have people that helped me understand like, hey, like this, this isn't you, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, you, you, you come across much better when, when you're only consuming cannabis. And I think for my mom, like she, like for instance, if I would post just even a picture on Facebook, not, not just my mom, you know, my, my stepdad, my family members that I haven't really communicated in Alabama with that didn't really understand, you know, what I was doing with my life being in the cannabis industry, they all just started to notice something different about me. They would mm-hmm. comment, you know, you look really happy, you look healthy. And I think it just came from, I remember my doctor actually, Ben, was probably one of the first ways that helped me understood the difference. He said, like, you, you have facial expressions, hmm. you're smiling. And I felt like you didn't really notice that before because you're kind of just in a zone and you're like, I kind of, I called it a goat and <laughs> just going to the doctor, just being fed the same thing and, and, you know, being told to do a certain thing and thinking that because this is a doctor, I should trust them. And not I, when I got into patient outreach, uh, one way that I help people understand was you don't go to the same hairstylist that didn't do the blonde that you wanted or that didn't listen to you or just you didn't even like the conversation because you didn't vibe the same. You, right. you don't go back to them. You have the same option with doctors. You can fire them. And it just you know took me understanding that and people explaining to me. And when my mom saw it, it was, it was incredible. Well, it, it's a, a lot of people just trust doctors, especially of older generations, like they know everything and I'll do whatever they say. And now, as we were talking the past couple of days, is that you have to be your best advocate and really understand what works for you. And they may not know, you know, they see hundreds of patients. So, you know, you really need to do education on yourself and what's out there for you. And then actually try to educate the doctors if they're, <laughs> if they're closed minded to it, because you know, they're not in it day to day and they've got a lot of old, a lot of doctors are older and, you know, have a lot of opinions around that. So it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, did you, did you, um, re, do you remember some, you know, back when you were heavy opioids, do you remember, uh, as much as you do say on cannabis, like looking, <laughs> back, looking back, uh, you know, it's, it's actually really funny that you asked that because this is something that you and I didn't discuss at all. So an, another battle that I'm facing that's also in line with you know, the medical world and, and what's happening around the opioid epidemic and options people have is I actually was implanted with a spinal cord stimulator hmm. back in 2012 or 2013, actually, this is beginning 2013 and got a newer model in 2015. So I had a a newer model with higher frequency and with just different technologies, clearly not long-term testing, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that was being put in people and instead of given opioids, you know, Mm -hmm. as a way of pulling back from opioids. And Mm. um, I I had that implanted before I was able to, to make the choice and, you know, before just kind of happened the way the laws worked and everything in Chicago to where that came first. And uh, one, another thing that I'm fighting a- along with this is that I realize things that the medical device are doing to my brain, I didn't notice whenever I 
was taking opioids and consuming cannabis. Mm -hmm. But once I got opioids cleared out all the way and was just consuming cannabis, and of course had this device, I was able to tell that, you know, my memory obviously much better, uh, but also that it wasn't, my brain wasn't working the same. Oh. So I've, I've kind of brought up the fact that, well, in my medical records, I'm a chronic marijuana user. So <laughs> it could be from that, or it could be from the fact that, yeah, you're right. Uh, the fact that this device intercepts pain signals in your brain and makes it to where you're able to function and, and walk, you know, and not feel certain nerve pain, that it might actually be doing something else in there too. Right. And, yeah, I mean, it's just like with a lot of opioids that there are a lot of side effects, you know, and when you combine two, it creates, you know, challenges that may affect you negatively, just like some some medical implants, I understand, too. So mm -hmm. well, crazy well, world out there. But yeah, I mean, hopefully, really, hopefully really we can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> a really interesting story. You know, I, I it's interesting how you move from state to state and, you know, dealt with the laws and changing attitudes and stigma and you know, I'm really happy to see that you found, you know, kind of where you are and that you're on a path to, to feeling better. So thank you for being on the show today. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate your time. How can people get a hold of you if they want to talk to you more about your story? I think the best way, uh, Canabama Christie uh, at Gmail. That's my email address, uh, my personal email. So I'll, I'll keep it personal here. And as well, that's my Instagram account, Canabama Christie. That's so awesome. I'm able to see some different stories. I haven't been sharing too much, but I plan to get on that more. Well, that's great. Well, I hope this year is good for you. What do you What do you have coming up that you're looking forward to? I'm I'm here in Michigan, and I, I am working in in sales for cannabis, and uh, my my team is also applied in Illinois, and um, I'm excited about the opportunity that Alabama and and Georgia are are looking into. To well, Georgia already and Alabama, no smoking, you know, but it's it's just exciting that things are popping up. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to use you know, my relationships and history and in places that I've lived and people like Alabama football players that, you know, also want this. And, and you know, I'm hoping we can all work together and, and make some change in, in all states. Well, great. Well, keep up the keep up the great job and, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks. Uh. Uh -huh. All right. I'll be in touch. Appreciate All it. Right. Then. We'll see you. Bye.